All right, welcome to this episode of the Justice Team Podcast. I am Brandon Simon, and today we're going to be talking about bad faith, open policy, kind of everything that encapsulates dealing with bad faith and all of that nonsense. So um, I've got a panel here today. Uh, we're going to go around and introduce everybody. We'll start first with uh, Ben. So Ben, if you want to say hello and introduce yourself, tell us uh, your firm, you know, where you work and your specialties and take it away. Sure. Uh, so my name is Ben Simino. Uh, I'm an appellate lawyer with uh, Singleton Schreiber in San Diego. Um, I do uh, complex critical motion work and obviously appeals and writs. And um, I've been practicing probably for 13 years or so now. And um, obviously you are handling some, at least on the appellate level, but handling bad faith and open policies and all that fun stuff. Yeah, so actually, um, I'd say more of my bad faith experience is, is uh, in opposing MSJs in, in insurance bad faith cases. Um, so I definitely am in, in it at the ground level. Yeah, and we're, I, I definitely want to talk to you about that, especially dealing with the Pinto case and dealing with MSJs and the standard of proof and how, if anything has changed, but, but we'll get into that. So uh, we'll go around the room and we'll introduce Heather. So Heather, say hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Heather Siegler. Um, I'm an associate with the Simon Law Group. And before you were with us, you were working on the other side of the aisle, right? Correct. I was with defense, uh, insurance defense for almost 10 years. And Kieran, you as well. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Kieran Doherty with the Simon Law Group as well. Uh, I thought Brandon was going to introduce me and make me sound awesome. I'll have to do it myself. Uh, prior to coming to the Simon Law Group, I worked as an insurance defense attorney. And then prior to that, I was an adjuster and supervisor with Farmers Insurance. So, you know, I was the bad guy on the claim side for a little over a decade. All right. So, yeah, I want I, Heather and Kieran are going to have some perspectives about what happens on the other side when you get demands and, you know, round tabling and talking to the insured and reporting and everything. So it's definitely a good perspective to see how things work on the other side of the aisle. So, um, you know, the, first let's, we've done bad faith podcasts before, but it's been a while. So Ben, can you just tell us kind of what, for people who don't know what bad faith is or don't understand what that word means, give, can you tell us just briefly, clip notes, what is bad faith? What is an open policy? What does that all entail? Sure. So um, bad faith is kind of a shorthand reference for insurance companies that um, mishandle claims against their insured. So this is the insured is the defendant in like a tort case is, is typically when this arises. And um, let's say someone was involved in an accident and they were covered by a million dollar policy through some insurance company. Um, and let's say there was uh, a, a demand made by the plaintiff in that case on the policy limits and there was justification for asking for the policy limits and the carrier uh, refused to pay that. And then the case proceeds to trial against the defendant and the, the plaintiff in that underlying tort case gets an, what's known as an excess verdict, meaning uh, the jury awards damages uh, resulting in a judgment over that million dollar policy limits, um, maybe like $3 million, for example. So in that scenario, you've got potentially a bad faith case against the carrier for not settling within policy limits. And then typically what happens is there's an agreement between the defendant in that case and um, the, the party represent the, the attorneys uh, and, and the, the plaintiff. Um, and then that essentially allows them to not collect against the defendant's personal assets, like taking their you know cars and personal property, and instead go to get that um, excess judgment, the, the 2 million above insurance limits, from the carrier directly. And that's kind of where the open policy um, concept comes from that now, because they had an opportunity to settle within policy limits and they didn't, um, essentially now it's as though there were no policy limits and it, supposedly the carrier is gonna then cut the check for whatever the actual uh, full judgment was. So that's, that's kind of, I'd say the most conventional familiar definition of bad faith. And <clears throat> Kieran, Heather, I mean, if you, what, What's the, the policy behind bad faith insurance? Why do we allow people to go go turn around and go after their insurance company? 
Well, you, you sign up for an insurance contract, right? And it's a contract of adhesion. You don't have a choice. You know, an insurance company writes a contract, and therefore they have a lot of power over you, and they have a duty to you um, to protect you, to protect your assets. And realistically, it comes down to if, if a reasonable demand is made, they have to act reasonably and accept the reasonable demand. And by doing so, if they accept the reasonable demand, they pay the policy, you're protected. They have a duty to you to protect you, protect your assets, make sure you don't have any judgment personally. Um, and if they don't do that, listen, if, if they would have accepted the demand, I think you know that's the main case we're talking about here is you know, if there's a reasonable demand. It's most of the time that that's what we're dealing with here with bad faith. If they would have accepted it, you'd be done. You'd be out of here. You wouldn't owe anything. And by them not doing that, they put you at risk. And that's kind of one of the reasons uh, that you can pursue them. So, uh, you know, dealing on on the other side of the aisle, Heather, uh, you know, I'll, I'll shift to you. What is, and maybe maybe you don't have the the same sort of since since Kieran was an adjuster, maybe it's better a question suited for him. But how does it work on let's say you get a demand, the insurance company gets a demand from, you know, my client or my firm. And at what point, what, what's the adjuster's duty? What, what is, what kind of triggers does that set into motion? Do they then have to talk to the insured, the person who holds the policy? Do they need to send them letters? Do they need to, what is their obligation as, as an insurance adjuster, as a representative for the insurance company at that point? Well, you're supposed to, but in my experience, if we got a demand letter and they weren't going to pay it, pay the policy, um, we might mention it in a report that would go to the client, but it wasn't really a one-to-one -one phone call. Hey, they made this demand. It was usually because of the tripartite relationship that California has, wherein you represent both the insurance company and the insured. The insurance company kind of takes the lead there. Um, and, go, and going off of what Kieran said, I actually have an interesting perspective because I was in-house for five and a half years and then I was panel counsel for another three and a half. And basically, in-house, you're expected to only have cases that you have a good faith belief will stay within the policy. That doesn't always happen. And then you're supposed to farm out the case to panel counsel. Um, and in those cases, from an in-house perspective, we would tell the adjuster, the adjuster would immediately tell us, you know, send out a letter indicating that for a 998, there's a good faith uh, protocol. We need, you know, all of the information in order to assess whether it's worth that amount. Uh, with panel counsel, it was always a little bit different depending on the insurance company. Um, and in with panel counsel, a lot of times the insured would be a lot more involved. So they would be notified right away. So Ben, let's say, you know, early on in the case, I'm a, I'm a pre-litigation standpoint, I send a, a comprehensive demand out to an adjuster. W what does the law say that an adjuster then is required to do? So I think that the term of art in, in the law, at least in California, is to do a, a reasonable investigation and, and appraisal of the claim. And, you know, essentially that means, at least as I understand it, looking at a couple things. One is whether the likelihood of, of uh, the damages is, is going to exceed the uh, policy limits. Um, which you know, obviously, that's a function of things like the economic damages and and you know potentially the non-economic damages, depending on, on the nature of the case, and then also um, a function of the likelihood of success and whether or not the claim is is pretty strong. Um, the problem with it is like obviously the, the the damage appraisal part is a little bit more objective. You can deal with numbers. You can sort of establish. Look, we've had this much in medical care, and we've got opinions that we need this much more, or we've got a, a legitimate wage loss claim. Things get a little bit trickier with um, kind of estimating the likelihood of of uh, a defense. I mean, I'm sorry, a plaintiff verdict. Um, well, I guess or a defense verdict, however you slice it. But the likelihood of success at trial, and that's where you know, in my experience, I've seen a lot of claim files where um, they seem to have the defense seems to have an inflated sense of. Of their likelihood of success, and so they're able to kind of say, "Well, sure, 
know, the damages are a lot, but we thought we'd beat this case, you know, seven out of 10 times. So when you sort of factor that in, um, we didn't really see policy limits exposure, but um, that gets a little bit granular. But the, but the bottom line is it's supposed to be reasonable. Um, you see a lot of terms in the case law, like not gambling with the insured's money. Um, so, because essentially, you know, going back to the policy limits, I mean, I'm sorry, the policy uh, rationale behind the, the bad faith law, if you didn't expose the carrier to the excess uh, in these types of cases, then essentially they're just betting with someone else's money. They're, they're saying, well, we think we'll beat this case. And if we don't, you know, the tab is going to be picked up by our insured and maybe they lose their house, but that's their problem, not ours. So, um, the standard is reasonableness and thinking of the insured's interest the same as you would with the carrier. Kieran, how do you how do you consider the insured's interest when you also are being paid for paid by the insurance company? Heather mentioned the tripartite relationship. How does that? Ah, uh, man, it's a tough one, especially like from the you know right, when you're in the claims you know in the claims department, it's a little different because you're not an attorney, you're not you know it's a different relationship. But as a defense attorney, like. <laughs> Realistically, I don't know. I, I think uh, I will say I was always very lucky that I was allowed to fully advocate for my client who was the injured, right? I, I never ran into an issue with that. I, I don't know. It could be I, I had a pretty good idea of the coverage aspect. I had a pretty good idea of what went on in the back end with the claims aspect. So I knew kind of what the pressure points were, um, why it was a pressure point. You know, I understood the bad faith. I understood all these things. Uh, but I think there's sometimes especially if you're not you know there's a an incentive to we're going to be tough on this case we're, we're a tough defense firm we fight these cases and and not being honest and say hey you should be paying the policy or realistically as a defense firm you should be you know realistically you should always be saying pay the policy it's always in your client's best interest to pay the policy right but if you do that you're probably not going to be getting you know too much too much volume sent your way so it really is a conflict, I think. It's a huge conflict, and I don't know. I'm glad I'm not on that side having to deal with it, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, it's – it's. Um, I have definitely ran into to defense uh, defendants, uh, defense counsel who are pretty beholden to certain adjusters and certain carriers, and um, it definitely can complicate things when – by law, I mean, right, Ben, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but your duty is to the insured, right, in California? You're talking about from from the perspective, well, I mean, really both, um, whether it's the carrier or the attorney, the, the duty runs to the, to the insured. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, – this Pinto case that came out in 2021, Pinto versus Farmers, because quite honestly, my you know we do a lot of open policy bad faith cases at my firm, and I I'm curious as to how Pinto changed the landscape of things and, and what we have to prove. So Ben, um, can you tell us what what Pinto this Pinto case what what does it say, and then we can get into kind of the burden of proof for us on an MSJ on a bad faith case. What is what is Pinto? So I, I have a little bit of like personal PTSD about the Pinto case. Um, I, I won't get into the reasons uh, for it, but um, in any case, the, the Pinto case basically um, maybe maybe it's easier to attack it by saying sort of what the understanding was before Pinto. And basically, the understanding before Pinto was that um, a, the party pursuing a bad faith claim against the um, insurance company had to demonstrate that. Uh, the insurance company didn't uh, take the opportunity to settle for a quote reasonable settlement offer. So you had to show that the settlement was was the policy limits offer was reasonable, um, which we sort of got into that before. And, and the reasonableness is basically in you know in light of the damages and the exposure, et cetera. So pre Pinto, essentially, if you showed that they had an opportunity to settle for a reasonable settlement offer. That was basically what you needed to, to do in order to set up your bad faith claim. Um, and in Pinto, what, what I guess it sort of stands for now is the idea that you have to show not only that there was a reasonable settlement offer, but that the failure to accept it was unreasonable, which is kind of like double unreasonableness. In my mind, 
I, I think it's kind of questionable when it would be reasonable to reject a reasonable settlement offer. Um, I guess the Pinto case sort of gives an example of that. And really what they focused on in that case was the fact that the, the plaintiff in the underlying tort action only gave the carrier something like 10 days. Um, I guess it was like eight you know, business, actual business days, but in any case, a very short period of time to um, accept the offer. And then making matters worse, they kind of put all these like conditions on the offer that we need certain uh, affidavits from the the defendant and and all these things that they needed in order to sort of consummate the deal. And the carrier tried to get them all signed and inked before that deadline lapsed. And I think did most of it and actually sent the letter saying, we accept and tendered, I think, even a check, but didn't supply all of the documentation that the plaintiff wanted. And the court basically said, look, you know, by not sort of working with them and giving them time to actually get everything done and wrapped up, um, they didn't really have a reasonable opportunity to to accept and consummate the deal. And so they were not acting unreasonably um, in the context of that case. I read Pinto very sort of narrowly. I I, I know everybody kind of says it's, it's a game changer. And certainly that's the perspective of the insurance companies. But I really think it's kind of an outlier case and sort of an exceptional factual circumstance. I think it's an example really of, of bad facts making bad law. Um, but that's essentially the the bottom line with Pinto. So um, Heather, I mean, I know you were you were still doing defense work when when that case came out. I'm curious, did was there any movement on like the defense bar to to really push Pinto or like change the way things are done? Did, was, was there any you know? Because I know when when certain cases come out in our industry, like the Howell case or and you know Pebbly Bermudez, everyone freaks out, and that's the new. But did, did anything happen on the defense side to where? You know, we handle things differently now because Pinto is out. What I'm curious. Honestly, no. Um, th- there wasn't any change whatsoever. I don't see the insurance companies making any huge changes based off of the Pinto case, really. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, honestly, the insurance company's position was that's always been the law, that you have to act reasonably or you have to act unreasonably. And that, I mean, I wasn't, I, funny, like I said, I was an adjuster. That case came out of the office I was an adjuster at. I was involved in the roundtables trying to get those declarations. And realistically, um, listen, man, they, farmers did a good job. Like, we were on it. Like, they would, they sent someone out, which the person was a cooperator, right? So there's nothing you could do. They're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. But it's always been the position, at least you know, from from them, that you, the, that that's always been the law. That I think it's a little like Ben said, like what's the difference between you know, you can make an argument that that at that demand wasn't reasonable because it was impossible for them to meet it, right? Versus they acted unreasonably, and it's really like, a, is it really a huge difference? I mean, it adds one more aspect, but it's kind of the same side, of, you know, a different side of the same coin. It's really not too much of a change. So Ben, when you're doing MSJs on bad faith now, is I'm I'm assuming that there's a lot of Pinto in the briefings. You know, they try to rely on it. Are you are, are you deal, are you seeing that a lot now, more than obviously before it came out? Yeah, and and I think this kind of, at least in my experience, um, Pinto has kind of become like a Trojan horse for a broader agenda that I'm seeing in the bad faith world, which is. Um, the real undercurrent here is that the carriers think that the the standard should be different than it is. So they they really don't think that like reasonableness is is a fair standard and think that bad faith should only arise when there's like malice essentially, like an intentional effort to sort of screw over the insured. Um, like I don't know what you would need some sort of like back room, you know, smoking cigars and like talking about how you know we're gonna just basically set this person up to fail. And so there's some like uncertainty, I guess. I mean, there's some cases that you can point to that kind of support that idea. I think it's largely discredited, but there are some whispers of that. And then I guess Pinto kind of like cited some of those cases. And so I've seen um, carriers using Pinto as kind of like, oh, you know, this, the court was really saying that actually you need some sort of scienter and that reasonableness is no longer the standard. I think that's a real stretch. Um, and, and I think we mentioned this before when we did kind of um, the, the seminar where we touched on bad faith, but um, I do read petitions for review um, kind of like almost as a hobby. And I am seeing a lot of petitions for review in um, bad faith cases 
in the Court of Appeal where, where carriers are basically appealing to the Supreme Court and saying, we really need to resolve this you know, uncertainty about the standard um, and, and hoping that the court will take that up and, and change the law. And so far, it hasn't had much success, but that's kind of like where I see Pinto often being invoked. So, <clears throat> I mean, from my perspective, and I mean, Heather, Karen, you guys worked on the defense side, so you can probably chime in as well. But if you're making demands from a plaintiff's perspective, make sure they're not set up to, to fail. Make sure you give them enough information, right? I mean, Heather, how many times do you think, when you get a, you know, a policy limit demand on your side, when you were on the defense, um, how often is it you responding and saying, you know, we appreciate your demand, but we need X, Y, Z. You know, we 99.9% of the time. Um, and actually I thought, and I think it was, uh, you recently had an idea of you're going to call up the adjuster or, or the defense attorney and say, Hey, I'm going to make a policy limits demand. What do you need from me? And I love that idea because inevitably you're going to get that anyway from the other side when you make a policy limits demand. And so you're feeding into their need to say, hey, here's what I need. Well, once you've checked off those boxes, they can't make that argument anymore. So you're cutting it off at the head. And I love that idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that there are a lot of, firms out there that anytime, anytime a 998 is sent or a demand is sent, it's just objected to. And it just says it's premature. We don't have X, Y, Z. Um, how important is it once you do get that response, once you do get that injection to actually respond to that objection? Kieran, you know what I mean? You know what I'm asking? So if you send a 998, it expires, but the date expires, they send an objection and say, this is premature. We, do you let that slide or, or, or should you be responding to that objection? We respond and we'll say specifically why you have what you need and this is why you have it. Or if they send it early, like, right, if they send it and it hasn't expired, like, well, you need to, well, then we'll set If we have it or we have a way to get it with it, then we'll send it to them. We'll send everything, right? And I think last time we said, like, listen, give them enough shoelace to trip themselves. Give them as much as they want. What do you need? Oh yeah, we'll get it for you we'll get it and give them. Um, and it's a balance, right? On bigger policies, they're gonna need more. On smaller policies, they're not. But we respond, make sure we say, you have what you need, this is why, and explain why. And just make it nice and clear. And we're just really, realistically, we're creating a record for any future bad faith case of showing exactly what they needed and why. So um, I kinda wanna shift focus a little bit to you're litigate, litigating a case now in the underlying case, and you it is an open policy. At least you think it's an open policy. Um, well, well, before I get into that, I mean, I'm curious, you're, Ben, Ben, are you doing a lot of litigating a lot of cases the under or the underlying cases that you believe open, or are you mostly just doing stuff on the appellate side on the bad faith open policy? Um, good question. I would say at least the last few cases that I've done, I've been brought in at least me personally, um, have been brought in purely like in the context of the bad faith uh, lawsuit. Um, and I think that the trial lawyers that hired me in most of those cases, well, maybe it's an even split. I would say there's it's about half and half that some were brought in only to help with the bad faith case. Others, uh, there's been a couple that, that were involved in representing the plaintiff in the underlying case. So the reason I ask is, um, you know, we're... At our firm, we, we get a lot of cases to, to look at and people will, will tell us, hey, it's an open policy case, like run with it. And, I, you know, I have to explain to a lot of people that it's it's not a it's not a yes or no answer. It's not that simple. It's not just, OK, it's a push, push the button. It's open. What advice would you give to because you're looking at it kind of in a retrospective. You're looking at the claims file. You're seeing things. What advice would you give to people that are trying to figure out, hey, is Mike, I know it's a loaded question, there's a lot of factors, but what advice do you think you would give to somebody when they're looking at these demands and these responses on a level of confidence to say, okay, this, this is probably open or not open? What would you kind of say to somebody who's, who's looking at those, those responses from the defense, the insurance company? Yeah, so I'm, I love this question. I'm glad you asked. Um, I mean, just I'll take a step back and say, as appellate lawyers, I mean, we we live in the record. That's the coin of the realm. And so 
Um, one of the things that's really unique about uh, bad faith cases, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, is that you're basically creating your own record. There's like not a lot of times when, as a plaintiff lawyer, you're sort of creating your own evidence. Most of the time, the cases come to you and they're just sort of baked in. This, there was something that happened and, and it is what it is. And you just kind of have to like put it all together and discover facts. But you're making your own evidence in these cases. So um, I say that because y- you basically... Your checklist should be um, a couple things. One, did you respond to requests from the other side for more information? Whether you sort of do that before you send the demand, which I think is genius. I agree with Heather. I think that's that's super smart um, if you do that. Or you know, even if you do that and they still come back and say, we need something else or we're waiting on this. I mean, did you respond to those? Um, did you fulfill all of those those requests so that you know, someone looking at everything retrospectively would say, look, the plaintiff gave them everything that they said they needed to evaluate the case. Um, I think you also need to kind of demonstrate to yourself and, and confirm to yourself that your damages really do exceed that policy. And, and I think you also kind of need to take into account the likelihood of success, which again, gets a little squirrely because it's kind of subjective as to like, okay, we tried this case 10 times. I think we're going to beat them 9 out of 10 or 8, out of, whatever it is. But I think you, you know if you've got a case where there's no disputed liability, um, you know it's a rear ender or something. Great, you know that kind of takes that off the, the the checklist. But if there are disputed issues, you really kind of want to make sure that you've tipped your hand and demonstrated why exactly you think you're going to crush them at trial. Um, and then you know pr- particularly in light of Pinto, but I think even before that, um, that you gave the other side enough time to respond uh, to the demand, to accept it and evaluate it. And didn't just like give them this demand with this like really really short um, you know time limit, and then they you know didn't accept it within time. I mean that I think potentially is is fragile when you're trying to to uh, pursue a bad faith case. And on that point, I mean you have again you're 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 creating your own evidence. You can say, look, if you need more time, let me know. Um, if you if you feel like you don't have enough time to evaluate this, let me know. And then when there's the absence of something from them saying we need another thirty days, um, you know, then that kind of argument is going to go away uh, when you're doing your bad faith case. And I I just want to drop one more point here before we leave this because this is the other big trend that I'm seeing. Um, we talked about a, a moment ago the idea that like the standard should be more than reasonableness. But the other trend that I'm seeing in case after case, so it must be like, you know, all points bulletin on the defense side, um, is this idea that, oh, the plaintiffs were just setting up the bad faith case. Um, and there's some like concurrence from some court of appeal case that they always cite um, where it's like basically some justice that doesn't like bad faith is like bemoaning the idea that these poor carriers are all getting set up. So they're they're primed to sort of like make this argument on the back end that this was just like a setup the whole time. And the more you can demonstrate that that's not true, that you were trying to be helpful, you weren't hiding the ball, you were doing whatever you possibly could, um, the better the better off you'll be. So just understand they're going to make that argument. You know it's coming. You don't want to 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 sort of walk into that box and make their life easier. It, yeah, and realistically, it shouldn't matter what what our intent is if the demand was reasonable and you should have paid it. But on that same token, you want to keep your hands clean as much as possible. Uh, you did bring up a good point though. I wanted to ask um, Heather this because you said, you know, the demand at the time the demand is made, the dam- the damages at the time the demand was made need to have exceeded the policy or expected to exceed the policy. Um, I see this a lot and Heather, I'm curious what your thoughts are when you see that, when you would see this on the other side, I would see policy demands and people wouldn't have surgery yet. Let's say it's, you know, it's a, it's a hundred thousand dollar policy or a two fifty policy. Somebody doesn't have a surgery yet. And it's not really even a surgical recommendation, but there's some discussion about this person, you know, has tried epidurals. They may need a surgery or down the line. If these injections don't work, they may need a surgery. How much do you look into that? That I don't even call it a recommendation, like a soft recommendation. I see that a lot when people bring us policies. What What is your um, viewpoint? You know, coming from a defense minded, what, what do you see when you see that sort of thing? If If there's even sort of a fuzzy line of okay, we're not sure if they're getting 
uh, surgery, then for sure, I, I as a, from a defense perspective, wouldn't consider uh, that if it was a policy that's demand, I wouldn't consider us having blown the policy unless there were other factors involved. Like she had, she, he or she had a number of injections, or there was evidence that whatever conservative treatment was going to fail or had a higher probability of failing. Otherwise, in my experience, the carriers, I've never seen them openly admit, like, yeah, we blew that, the policy's open. Never in a case like that. On the carrier side, if that recommendation pretty much doesn't carry any weight, obviously it depends if it's a smaller policy, but for the most part, if it's if, if X, then, then Y, it doesn't carry very much weight. It but, has to be their surgical candidate. Uh, but like you could bring up a really good point with a small policy. For example, we have a case right now uh, where it was at 1530 policy and there was there was a recommendation for injections, but the injections hadn't occurred yet. And so the insurance company in that case said, well, she hasn't gotten the injection, so we're not going to give you the policy. And so we did what we needed to do by repeatedly saying, here's the medical record. Here's uh, the recommendation. Here's her seven millimeter herniated disc. She's going to need this injection. Give us the policy. And they sat on it. And so we made our policy limits demand. We gave them 30 days. They didn't say anything other than we need more than a recommendation. And they're definitely, I didn't mean to cut you off, Karen, but it, you know, we've been talking a lot about giving them enough information and giving them enough time. There are definitely scenarios where, okay, I'm not giving you any more time or any more information. That's probably one, I would assume. Yeah, I think it's also the smaller the policy, the easier it is to open it, right? I mean, the less information they need, the bigger the policy, the harder. Um, and I think there is a difference. I, uh, the, an actual recommendation saying they need this, I think, is needs and should be taken seriously. And I think carriers do do. But if it's, for example, like if this fails, then they need that. They're not going to take that seriously because the, the if hasn't happened, right? But uh, the actual recommendation they should, they're not always taking it seriously. They should be. Yeah, a lot of times I feel like it's just we don't believe that you will get it. <laughs> Not that you don't need it, but we don't think that you will get it. Um, I, so let's, let's talk about in the context of you're litig litigating a case now and you do believe it is open. Um, I think there's probably a, a big misconception from people that you have to go. The only recourse left is to go and try it and get a judgment and collect on it. Uh, what, are, what are some of the things that you could do to pressure uh, payment over policy to settle a case short of a trial? What have, what have you seen, Heather, Kieran, on your side, you know, between coverage opinions, personal, what, what kind of pressure points do you guys recommend to people to get money over policy before a verdict to settle the case? Or you're not going to get anything if you don't demand it, first off. So once you know the policy is open and you're comfortable with it, make that over policy demand. And um, we'll actually, a lot of our older policy demands, we do this, like, a lot of times we come in and it's a bigger policy, like a million policy, right? And that's a little harder to open. And so we'll give, like, a one last chance, right? And we'll just outline, like, this is what's happened. This is where you've made your mistakes. This is why you made your mistakes. These are our client's injuries. This is our client's story. This is what's going to happen. And once you, and we're just laying it out. It's literally just written as a bad fact thing. So, like, the whole point of writing this letter is so that when it gets to Ben, Ben's like, ha, 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 that letter. Like, it laid everything out and everything you laid out happened. But we'll do that in the in the, in the uh, demand over policy too, right? We'll say, this is where you messed up. This is why you messed up. This is why the policy is open. It's clear. Here it is. Here's the client's injuries. And then make a demand. And it's just a nice pre-letter that's maybe like seven, eight pages that just is a summary of every mistake and why the case is worth more than it is. And it just looks really pretty. So when Ben gets it, he's like, oh, yeah. And, and how often do they immediately say, okay, we agree with you? Oh, every time. No, never. <laughs> On the first chance, never. But eventually, the closer and closer it gets to a trial and like a verdict is going to be coming, it's, you know, the more likely that, that above policy offers coming. That would be my advice is, um, you know, if you're litigating a lot of open policy cases, a term that I always use is it's a, it's a slow burn. And especially in the, the world of COVID where we didn't have trials for a long time, until there is a trial date, on the horizon that you know that that's going to happen 
a lot of times they're not going to, they're, they're just going to wait and drag their feet before they pay anything over policy. Cause that, and Heather, you can probably fill us in what getting money over contractual money. How difficult is that for an attorney or an adjuster to go and get over contractual over policy money to settle your case? It's insanely difficult. Um, and I would say it would need to, at least without a trial, be one, a mess up that the attorney would have to admit to and admit to the adjuster, which takes money away from their pocket. They're going to lose that account. Um, so nine times out of 10, they might try to backtrack and say, well, it wasn't a mistake because X, Y, and Z. And if the adjuster believes that attorney, then they're not going to, they're not going to open the policy. Um, so it is very, very difficult. Um, I, I do like, and we did take it more seriously when we would get the kind of letters that Kieran was saying. And my favorite thing that they would do to get the adjuster to pay attention and take it more seriously is we'll mediate this before trial. If the policy is the floor that that language, for some reason, always caught the adjuster's attention. And that was, a, oh, uh, we really need to. Uh, I was going to I was going to cuss and I'm like, I'm not sure if we're allowed to here, but it was the, it was the, oh shit moment of, oh, they really believe the policy's open. They said, why we need to take this seriously and offer the policy, hope they take it or mediate it and offer a little bit more to appease them. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've mediated an open policy case where the first mediation is the defense side says it's not open. We're not paying a dime over policy. Maybe we'll offer you five, ten thousand over policy, but we're very confident it's not over policy. And what I would say to, to people that are handling plaintiff attorneys that are handling that that aspect, if you are very confident that policy is open and you're very confident in your damages, don't. Um, it, it, most of the time, it is a bluff, and then most of the time, you have to just to just grin and bear it and hold on to that case and push it all the way to the trial doorsteps. Because even bad faith cases, we try a lot of cases, but most. 95% of them that are open policies, probably more, still settle, either during trial, right before trial, sometimes right after a verdict. Um, ben, what do you see on your side when you're dealing with, you know, you see claims files and uh, how how involved are our personal counsel and Cumis counsel? Maybe you can kind of tell people what Cumis counsel is. Not everybody knows, but what's their role and how do you how can you use them to your advantage uh, when you're litigating the underlying case? So I may not be the best person to ask about this because I don't think in any of the files that I've touched, there was Cumis counsel. Um, I mean, I'm familiar enough generally that it's essentially when there's um, a, a um, reason to believe that there's now a conflict of interest um, and that the uh, carrier is not able to, uh, def the insurance defense counsel is not able to adequately represent the interests of the insured that um, he or she needs their own personal counsel to make sure that um, their interests are being looked out for. Um, I think that, I mean, anytime you get in that situation, I think it puts the carrier in a really, really bad spot because obviously that um, the, the Kumis counsel doesn't have any real reason to say like, oh, you should maybe push this a little further. We don't think that a policy limit settlement is a good idea. Like they're, they have no real reason not to push for that. Um, it's certainly in their insured's best, their, their client's best interest. So that usually is kind of a game changer. Um, again, I haven't dealt with that in the bad faith context in particular, but when I've seen it, it usually definitely moves things. Um, what I have seen that's kind of along those lines is um, where uh, the, the uh, insured will submit a letter uh, to the carrier that's in the file that basically says, look, uh, you know, I am imploring you to please pay the policy limits um, and, and please settle this within the policy limits because I'm terrified of the prospect of an excess verdict. And that is a helpful exhibit. Um, that, that's part of the arsenal if, if, there, if the file has one. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Obviously, you know, you don't have control over that as the plaintiff lawyer, but um, th those are things that I think fall kind of into that same realm where the, the insured is really pushing um, and putting some pressure on the carrier to settle within policy limits. I suspect that sometimes they um, are effective, although I, I would defer to, to Heather and Kieran on that. But um, 
the, the, anytime I've seen that in the file, it's like, okay, that that's going to be part of the story for sure. Well, I think it brings up a good distinction too, right? Because the carrier is not going to provide. So Cumex is when the carrier themselves is paying an independent counsel to represent, right? And they're not going to do that in the, in the context of a bad faith case. They're going to argue that their goal is the same as the client's insured is to have the smallest verdict possible, right? It's though, but the client, the insured there is entitled to personal counsel that they're going to pay out of their own pocket. But realistically, like a lot of people, a lot of these personal counsel will do it you know, either very cheap because this insurance company is screwing them or they're not going to charge them. So it's trying to get, let the client know. A lot of insurance don't know that you're allowed to have personal counsel and you got, you might have to pay for it out of your pocket or come to an agreement with them. But the carrier is almost never going to agree to actual cumulus counsel on an open policy case because they're going to say, no, 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 we're in alignment. We all want the lowest verdict. There's no conflict. Um, so that's a little misconception I think I see, but the personal counsel, and that's huge. We write in our letters like at the front, like, oh, you know, we'll write it like, oh, obviously they should, you know, please advise us who the client's personal counsel is. And we write it in a way that it's like, you know, the, the person reads it, well, the way they write this, I definitely should have one. Why don't I? Um, because they make a huge difference pushing that personal counsel just saying pay the policy, pay the policy. Is there, is, is there a uh, CUMS counsel and, and coverage counsels, are they the same thing or are they different? So typically, when you say coverage counsel, that's like the the carrier hires coverage counsel to represent them and say this is the coverage opinion. Cumulus counsel is very rare. Cumulus counsel typically comes in more on cases where there's a coverage question, right? A lot of times, uh, like uh, where there's maybe an intentional act type situation where there's possibly an issue of uh, the carrier does one thing, but if they argue that it gets rid of coverage, and there's a huge conflict there. Carriers try to avoid Cumulus counsel because it's really expensive, right? It's really expensive to pay someone separately outside a panel counsel you don't have an agreement with. Um, and they're not going to, I very rare if ever, are they going to provide that on It's just a typical case, policy demanded. We're claiming the policy is open because you didn't pay. There was no coverage questions or anything like that. That's where it's personal counsel versus cumulus counsel. Interesting. How, uh, if the two of you, if you have had, if you have ever had to do it, Heather and Kieran, uh, had to go to an adjuster and tell them you screwed up. The policy's open. You should put more money on the case. <laughs> have you ever had to do that? And how, have you been successful in doing that? Or Kieran, you were an adjuster. Have you ever have you ever had an attorney tell you that, Kieran, when you were an adjuster? Uh, I mean, I'll say I've I've had it told me a million times. I I'm, I'm pretty reasonable. Um, I honestly can say I went an entire decade and never opened a policy. I probably paid more policies than I should have, but I went an entire decade and never opened a policy once. So. Uh, as an adjuster, I've dealt with them as a defense attorney, and when you fucked up, but yeah, Heather, I'll leave that to you. If you if you got money over the policy, tell us how you did it. <laughs> I didn't end up getting money over policy. They paid the policy. I did tell them though that they did misevaluate the case. Uh, in this particular situation, a dog bit off a girl's nose. She was like twelve at the time, and she had a really good plastic surgery result, and she was a tomboy. So in her deposition, she says, she testified, the scar doesn't really bother me. It, yeah, it's there, I see it every day, but you know, I'm a tomboy, it's not a big deal. They glommed onto that and never retreated from it. Oh, it doesn't bother her, it's, it's not worth the policy. Um, and I had to, one, get the insured to write a letter to the adjuster. This was a my Hail, Hail Mary pass saying, I don't want this to go to trial. I don't want to have to pay any money. Please pay the policy or at least offer it because at this time the attorney felt it was open and I agreed. Um, the letter actually ended up working to at least get them to offer the policy. And on the eve of trial, they took the policy. Yeah, I think um, something that I hear a lot when I speak to defense attorneys, because sometimes if this would be my advice, and again, you, Heather, Kieran, you guys have worked on that side of the aisle. Um, sometimes you can call up a defense attorney and have a candid discussion with them about why the adjuster isn't tendering a policy or why they're not thinking the policy is open. And oftentimes it's something, at least again, I've found something that they've dug into 
way, 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 you know, sometimes before you're even involved. Sometimes it's a pre-litigation where they, they papered a file and they thought liability was sewed up and something came to light. And, and how difficult is it for an adjuster to go have to go back and basically fix that and say, look, we, we misevaluated that liability aspect. Now there's something that came out where we have to readdress that. How difficult is that to do? So if you're talking over the policy, I know Heather, you talked about how much, how crazy it is earlier to get over the policy. Like if you're getting money over the policy, it's literally like the high up executive level is involved. It's like it's everyone's in, you know, everyone's not in a room anymore, but it's like you're talking to the high up executive, not like the, you know, C suite executive. You're talking to the big time executives, the ones who are running the company. That's that's where you're getting you know money over the policy. To pay the policy, you know, it's depending on the level of the policy, how big the policy is, there might be different different layers involved. It's not as hard. Uh, anytime you change your initial evaluation, it's, you know, it's kind of a pain, but not a big deal. But to get over the policy, like it's like high end, high up executives are involved in that discussion for any money over the policy, like any money at all. Um, so that's, it, it really depends if you're trying to pay the policy or go over the policy. It's, it's tough. And Ben, on the appellate side, you get to see, or the, the bad faith side, you get to see all of that documentation, all of how, how they interact with executives and how claims adjusters. Um, so it's, uh, I, we've only done a couple of, of bad faith cases and we only, we've only got a hold of two claims files. <laughs> um, but I'm curious, I think we, we're running out of time, but I'm curious as to uh, how often you ha- you've been approached with like a bad faith case after a judgment and then the case resolves before you can get that claims file. So how, how far do they usually have to push it? Do they, do they say, you know what, come, come and get us, come get the claims file or do, sometimes do they bluff before that time comes to hand over that claims file or to, to depose the adjuster? How far do you see yourself having to push these things? Yeah, I mean, I've never been involved in a bad faith case where I didn't have the claim file because of just like the, the nature of me being brought in kind of, you know, at the MSJ stage where we're, we're going to blows. Um, so I've read some claim files and I mean, they're like super juicy. Um, I, I, think probably reading claim files is like my favorite like record review you know it's like <laughs> i almost wouldn't charge for it i mean it's the stuff that you see in there is pretty <laughs> yeah i mean it's like it's it they're awesome um and it's you know honestly it's like not just like you know prurient interest in reading the claim file like it does make you better um, as a lawyer and, and sort of looking at the cases from the ground up, like you read one claim file and I think you probably learn a ton about how to set up a, a good bad faith case. Um, but yeah, they're, they're pretty awesome. They're pretty juicy. They're wild. Uh, yeah. Some of these adjusters that put things in there, you're like, oh my God, why would you put that in there? The log notes are hilarious most of the time. I, I, he, he, you made me reminisce for them. So I, we're, um, we're, we're rest, right on the, uh, up to to closing time here. But the one thing that, so I'm glad Ben brought that up. So something, if you're handling a bad faith case or a case that you think is an open policy case, remember everything that you write, good or bad, is going to be part of that claims file, is going to be a potential piece of evidence at the bad faith trial or the MSJ. The, The best thing that you can do, in my opinion, this is what I do, and maybe it's just because that's my personality and I'm a reasonable guy, but have as clean of hands as possible, give them as much information as possible, be as accommodating as possible, even if it's um, not the most savory of defense attorney or, you know, a pretty mean adjuster. Uh, It's protect your, protect your own bad faith case going into the second phase because it's, it's really important. Um, Sometimes you can't get past the MSJ if you're, if you're, not papering your file correctly. So, uh, any any last parting words before we before we close today about the world of bad faith and open policies from everybody? I think what you just said is most important. Just write everything as if it's going to be a bad faith exhibit. Even if you're right, if you're a dick, no one wants to like agree with you. If you're nice, you know. Civility is really important in this situation, for sure. Uh, you yes, you have to advocate for your client, but at the same time, you have to realize that. The more of a jerk you are in your writings, in your phone calls, in your emails, the more they're not going to take you seriously. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, I think the fact that we're all sort of homing in on the same point is should be telling to the audience because the one the the toughest bad faith cases that I've dealt with were where the plaintiff lawyer was just really disagreeable um, and just kind of a jerk. And there's you know emails in there, and you know I've been able to get around it thankfully, but it, it definitely makes it for a much bigger lift when the the person handling the case was just kind of a jerk. And you know, they're going to try to paint you as someone that was a, a, an obstacle to settlement. Um, and so, you know, why give them sort of that rope to hang you with? Just be as accommodating and nice as you possibly can. You'll have a much easier time with the bad faith case. All right. Um, well, I, I, we're almost on an hour now. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining us. I, lo- I love talking open policies and bad faith. Most of my work day is looking at cases that are probably open policies. So um, you guys give me some good information to to help with my own evaluation stuff. So hopefully it's pretty informative and everybody out there listening, take some advice and don't be a dick, right? If you take one thing from this entire podcast, that's it. I'm with you. All right. Thank you, guys.